All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Candice. Um, as Candice said, my name is Jory Burse, and I'm the VP of Standards here at the Linux Foundation. And I'm joined by my wonderful colleague, Joaquin Prado. Say hello, Joaquin. Hello. <laughs> so Joaquin and I make a really interesting team because Joaquin's background is in um, is, is is really in that standards um, and and standards administration um, practice, and he's coming and has been working with the Linux Foundation for a few years now. So really leaning into that open source. Conversely, my background you know, started in open source and then grew into the standard space. And um, that's kind of a, 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 good, a good grounding for why we're gonna talk about community spec today. Uh, and we thank everyone here uh, for joining us. Um, so one of the first questions that uh, you, know, you might be asking, and we don't presume anybody here has uh, any prior experience whatsoever, so we're keeping it simple, is, is really what is a specification and why and how might it be different from um, open source uh, where, I'm, where I'm used to working. Um, I like to say that it's a specification is like a recipe. It's, it is not the cake, it's not the finished product itself, but it's gonna tell you how to bake the cake, make the product. It's gonna give you all of the information that you need uh, to know what you should do, what you should not do, uh, in order to um, be a, an implementation of that, uh, of that technology or that idea. So it'll give you information like, what uh, do you need to uh, have? What, what is uh, dependency? What, what must you have um, versus what, what you could have, what you should have, what might be optional and so on. Um, and there's some things just like an open source that make a good specification uh, you know, and make one that easier to implement if you're, if you're developing a spec. So things like glossaries, um, conformance criteria, and using notes documents, again, to call out what might be more illustrative, more helpful, um, and of course, other information like what's the status of this specification? Is it uh, just something that's in sort of an ideation phase? Is it a draft, a pre-draft? Um, are there other uh, you know, uh, things that you need to have as dependencies in order to, um, to, to have a, uh, an implementation of this technology? So think of it like a recipe um, or like, yeah. Um, so why should open source projects have uh, specifications? Why are, they, why are they important? Why are they helpful? Um, why should this uh, open source software developer think about standards and specifications? Well, they can do a lot to amplify the work that you have going on. Um, they can really help uh, you define products improve performance, um, improve interoperability between your technology and others. Um, you may have a project that relies on an upstream specification, and so it's gonna be really helpful or um, useful for you to get involved or to provide some specification that maybe narrows a gap between your technology and that upstream technology. Um, it can help you uh, further third-party development if you're thinking about this from an ecosystem perspective. Um, and then of course, if you're thinking about doing a new specification uh, project to, to an existing uh, open source project, that can help you really increase your project's ad adoption rate, uh, enable other, again, uh, interoperability opportunities, and of course, provide an open source license for you know, implementation of your ideas of your technology beyond a source code base. Um, one th thing that, uh, you know, I think kind of scares open source developers away is that big capital S word standard. Um, and it can feel like, uh, you know, something more formal. But something that I've been saying recently to open source developers is that saying the capital S standard is another way of saying an agreement. And um, a specification, of course, is, is strengthened through a standardization process. Um, and if you think about a community standard or community specification that you're, you're building, maybe that's okay for you and your collaborators and maybe close collaborators um, to, to work on together and that's sufficient. We're looking for sort of like that you know, process efficiency. Um, but as you kind of go down, I've got the arrow pointing down here and, and you want to um, 
increase the level of agreement, um, that's going to require more, more proof. And so you go from something that's like, here's a, a group of folks who have uh, agreed that a specification should sort of be the standard practice um, for some, uh, some purpose to perhaps you know, de facto standard because more and more folks have adopted that, uh, begun to implement that and are um, furthering that to maybe an industry standard because this is um, something that you want to advance through a, a, a consortia, maybe a specialty consortia. Um, and then finally, de jure standardization, which means that this is a, a specification or a standard that you want to um, get implemented into policy, uh, into, into law, into regulation. And of course, as that, uh, as that um, agreement level needs to go up, we require more, more proof. And that's, that's what that uh, whole activity is, is um, designed to do. Um, what kinds of things might you standardize? This is another question that we sometimes get. You can standardize pretty much anything is what I've learned. Um, but very commonly in open source, you see uh, ontologies, schemas, um, programming languages, processes, design patterns, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of different things can be standardized and benefit from standardization. And just to give you a picture, um, we've got over 200 standards and specification projects at the Linux Foundation. A lot of people don't know that. They know us for the open source work. Um, but you know, increasingly, we're seeing a lot of open source projects that are wanting to develop specifications, which I'm seeing is sort of a move from the looser days of, of open source software development to maybe a, a need for a little bit more structure, a little bit more um, norming on, uh, on procedure and process for to, to ensure interoperability. So um, a lot of projects here. Um, some of the projects that you see here are on the community spec. Some of them are on the JDF uh, templates. Um, you know, and, uh, and some of them are really, really formal. Um, some of them are just uh, operating using the community spec and that's it, no fund, no, no extra spice on top of that. So a lot of flexibility, a lot of differentiation represented in this group. So as I mentioned, the Joint Development Foundation has a couple of different ways in which we um, support uh, project collaborations. And, and the, the, there's two that are sort of variations on the theme. Um, today, we're going to talk about the community specification, which is uh, a, more focused to the open source developer and the community who is looking to do more collaborative development work and an open source style of uh, workflow in GitHub or GitLab or you know some Git based um, uh, process. They are probably um, this. This could be for you if you are interested in that sort of and have that familiarity with that sort of open source software development. Um, process. Uh, conversely, we also have the traditional standards projects, which are based on some uh, wonderful templates and uh, agreements that have been battle tested uh, and, and allow you to spin up a legal entity very easily and quickly and operate in a more um, sort of what we would call traditional way of developing a standard, which some of you may or may not be familiar with if you've worked in other consortia. So um, the JDF and community spec options really try to provide the right balance of um, effort and structure and process. A friend who calls this sort of like meeting the process efficiency curve, um, and I think that's a really good way of putting it, in order to get um, the, the quality, the agreement, the um, you know, depth of work in uh, that you need to meet the standard of quality for like a publicly available specification, which is really kind of a, a level that we'd love to see all of our projects um, meet. Um, obviously, you know, you could do something really simple as Joaquin says, you know, it's best effort, you got two friends and a cat and you come together to, uh, you know, a, a agree on a process. Well, you, you do that however you're gonna do it. Um, on the flip side, 
farther side you, extreme, you might have a more de jure uh, process, which is going to require more, more time, more oversight, more procedure, that a whole thing is sort of elongated. Um, and community specification is really a, a, a tool that we have developed to, to again, meet that right balance of um, process and of structure and effort, uh, while also keeping things agile and um, friendly to open source uh, communities that want to move uh, you know at the pace of innovation which is kind of what we have been uh, kind of describing this this is a uh, a tool the the community specification license and framework are a tool to help you move faster on a specification project um, while also providing you the base set of governance licensing templates um, and so on and so forth and the uh, also the, the sort of developer friendly um, kind of ergonomics for adopting these things uh, so that you can get started quickly. Um, it's going to incorporate terms, um, again, uh, patterns that as a developer, you might already be really comfortable with, um, but maybe you're not as aware of as a in a formal standard uh, standards org. Um, so if you want to pursue that, if you do want to pursue formal standardization, community specification license does give you that, um, uh, that foundation you can build from. But if you just want to move quickly uh, and get some, get some stuff started, this is a great place, uh, a great way to, to, to uh, start. Another question that we get um, a lot is, why is there a need for a special um, license? Why can't I just use MIT or Apache 2 for my specification uh, project? Um, and the simple answer is that open source software licenses were not designed uh, with this idea of capturing patent licenses in, in uh, you know, as a as a matter of practice, um, in the specification project, you're you're dealing with multiple types of IP, and development of a specification is is really different from developing code. Sometimes there are situations where you uh, can use an open source license in your specification project, uh, but in general, you want to um, think about being very explicit and using a more appropriate license so that you're covering all the kinds of intellectual property commitments that your contributors might be making to your project. So this extends to implementations beyond your source code, and that is a really critical point. So um, I'm going to introduce you to communityspec.dev. If you head over there, that's going to redirect you to our GitHub um, repository. and. Uh, uh, you can start to go, go poke around there. Um, we'll be adding some other features to that site and new resources and documentation as we go. But easy enough to remember communityspec.dev, um, or you can star the repo. Um, but this is a repo that's going to get you started with all the core information and process that your spec project is going to need to start to define the scope and the purpose of your work together um, on the spec project help you define the IPR commitments for your contributors um, and for your um, implementers, the requirements for implementers, um, that governance and process in terms of decision making, in terms of how your specification will advance, in terms of what your exclusion period and um, public notice workflows are. And if, uh, we've also included in there a template that you can use to adapt to fit ISO um, formatting requirements or other formatting requirements, again, if you want to advance your uh, project to uh, another consortia. So that, in a really quick nutshell, is the intro to community specification. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Joaquin now to tell you how we, um, are, we you can get started. So thank you, uh, Jory. Uh, my name is Joaquin Prado. I'm a standards community architect uh, here at Linux Foundation. And we are going to see now a little bit more details about uh, what we have inside of the uh, standards, uh, the community license uh, specification. So in the next slide, what we have here is, and, and I need to give you another, uh, you know, early warning. Uh, in this presentation, we have included things that they are not yet 
in if you go to the current repository, but we are uh, building towards that and we thought it was worth it to insert at this point. So one of the things you have is, okay, there is a repository and the community specifications GitHub account. And that repository is called the community specifications. Very soon, we are aiming to change a little bit the name of the repository to call it to template. And the idea is to go to that repository template and click in the use the template. And immediately that I will allow you instead of GitHub to copy that template, that repository into your specific uh, organization account. In this case, we call my org. And inside of that organization account, you name this particular repository as my specs, as we listed on there, but you can have obviously whatever name you want. At that point, you have already done the copy of this structure with this frame, legal framework into your repository. And now the next step, step three, it will be where we are going to see now in more detail some of the documents that we recommend that uh, you should not modify, although there is always exceptions for everything. Some of the documents that we is we call it like a, an admin documents that you need to uh, fulfill or understand what is the content on there, and it's going to give you some of this uh, structure and uh, help you to in the life cycle of of your. Uh, a community and you, the things you are developing, but it's more on an admin side. And then there will be documents that are relating more about how to work in group, and that it will be the contributing uh, document. The organization process document is not yet dead, uh, there, but it's something we are trying to bring uh, for you guys um, in the next release. And then, obviously, at the end of the day, the only reason why you are doing this is because you want to build specifications. And that will be the side that you go and develop, and it will be your technical specifications, where you will be creating these documents that you want to share with the industry. And we as well advise about to create a release planning that you will see in a moment, which is a very light document, which is an inspirational document where you communicate to the group is working on that and exactly what uh, you planning to do by when. Mm -hmm. So these three simple steps, copy into your repository and then customize. Now in the next slide, we are going to look into some of these documents. And I mentioned before, there are some uh, documents that are um, like admins documents, if we call it like that. And they will be probably uh, the notice and the license documents that listed on there. The scope, it's a little bit tricky. It's an admin, in a way, document, but it's a really important one. And the reason for that is because the patents they are granted under the community specification process are restricted to the project scope. So if there is any patents that are being granted, you need to make sure that uh, they're covered within the scope. Anything outside of the scope, uh, you know, obviously it's not going to be covered. So a scope is a really important document. We advise to uh, implement it or, or fulfill it really early in the process because that will define the scope of the project and therefore the patents will follow into that scope. The other two documents, they are more pure admin, is the notice documents and the license. The notice document is, uh, it has four sections and that document contains, the first one is to, provide a contact email for raising code of conduct complaints. If someone has a problem, they need to contact someone. So the working group should early in the process to fulfill that section and say, if you have a problem, please contact this person and that will be an email address. The second thing is to indicate the I license, licensee accepts the license terms of the project. So I see this project, I say, that's great. I really want to incorporate this in my uh, work and I want to communicate that I'm doing that. So you submit a pull request against that section in the document notice indicating that uh, you are implementing this particular work. Mm -hmm. A third uh, use of this uh, notice document is to indicate the withdrawal from the working group uh, of any, uh, sorry, to indicate that you are moving out from the working group. This is important as well in, in some cases where you say, okay, my company is participating, but at this point we want to leave and we are going to make it 
uh, you know, uh, officially by submitting a pull request against the section of this document and indicating my company is leaving as of today. And that will be recorded on there for the group. And the other thing is about the community, uh, sorry, the communicate the exclusion notice. Um, remember one thing, as soon as you take the community specifications, you are walking into this uh, more structure a framework. And one of the things we say here is that uh, we capture the, the option or the possibility that someone submit a com, uh, contribution which contains some uh, patents. And obviously, if you, they do that, the community specifications indicate they are submitting under a royalty-free license patent. But for whatever the reason, the company decide that uh, that was a mistake. We need to withdraw that. There is a process on how to do it. We certainly, we don't encourage the people to submit something for later to remove it, but we are in, a, in some kind of a structure here and there is a process for doing these kind of things. So that is in the notice document. That's four important aspects of the administration. And another document that we have, like any repositories, you look into the license document. And the license documents in this particular case, you are going to find two things. One of them is a pointer that takes you back to the community specification license itself. And this is under uh, the license that you are submitting content to create the specifications. And the other thing is that if the group decide to create a source code, in that case, this is where indicates what source code or under what license this source code is going to be uh, contributed. And in if you don't indicate anything, by default, it will be under MIT. Nevertheless, it's possible for the group to change that, and there will be obviously a consensus for on, on how to do it. The other document that we have, and this is now you are moving outside of the administrative sites and more on how we work in the community specs. Like any repository, we have a contributing document. And this document describes how to contribute the work in that particular repository. Remember, the group potentially can have more than one repository. In that case, the copy that we did in uh, at the beginning, where you copy from the template, it should happen on all the repositories you want to bring along. But um, what you will have is that the, in each one of those repositories, you may change the way in, the way you work. You should communicate that to the community. Say, if you are collaborating in this particular repository, this is the steps that we follow. And something is not captured here, but uh, is coming, is that the, the process document. And this is some of best practice and guidelines that you will see, by the way, in the presentation later, where we provide you hand advice. You can take it or not, it's up to you, but at least we want to uh, help you to guide you through some of the, on how to build specifications. So that document eventually, we will want to incorporate it into the community specification repository. The next slide, we are moving now until the, I think is the documents that we do recommend to not modify. And you saw a, a jury present a slide where you see, you know, the amount of effort it requires to do our community specifications and there were some boxes topping each other. And this is where we say, there are some processes on there that uh, the community specifications is building for you and we, pretty much tell you please do not modify as everything in life there are things that could be in some cases for whatever the reasons to be modified and is the two documents that appear right at the bottom the governance with an asterisk and the code of conduct where maybe some reasons why there has to be some ad adaptation to that and the best thing is please reach out and we can work with you on that otherwise the documents that we have is the contributor license agreement which is this document basically says, as soon you submit a contribution, you are doing it under these rules. And specifically, we are going to see in a moment in the, you know, at least three documents that are key uh, inside of the community specification framework. Then we have the community specifications license itself. And this is where explain the framework, the legal framework for participating and contributing to the development of technical specifications. We are going to see some uh, notes on that related with copyright abundance. So this is a legal framework that 
again, we recommend don't change it. Governance is about where we provide some uh, definitions about, uh, you know, editors or maintainers and so on. And it's established, it's a very high level. That is the reason why we want to bring another document, the uh, organization process document, where it gives you the granularity of do's and changes as you need. Eh? And we will give you best practice on top of that. And then you have the code of conduct, which is the, the set of uh, values and rules, standards and principles outlining on uh, for the group on how to work together. Mm -hmm. So those documents, as I say, we recommend do not modify. And then obviously we go into the next slide, which is the two documents that is for the group to, to develop. Mm -hmm. Joaquin, we had one quick um, question from Dan Applequist in the Q&A about the code of conduct. Um, and so answering this live really quickly, uh, yep. some um, we do provide by default the contributor covenant uh, code of conduct. Um, that's what ships with the community specification license. We know that some of our projects are affiliated with other open source uh, foundations that may have an existing code of conduct that they would like to extend to the specification project. And so that is one example of when you might modify the code of conduct document, um, but the the license and the framework require the the code of conduct exists, and it requires that contributors attest that they will adhere to that code of conduct. Um, so uh, that's that's that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll move on to the next slide. Thank you, Jory. I, and by the way, I I didn't see the I I don't know what the reason why, but I don't see uh, the questions coming through. Yeah. So now we move into the, this is where the experts, this is the, the, you are doing all of this because you want to do work to reach out to the community. And here is where you develop the technical specifications. We give you as well a template, um, you know, what is the content should be on there. And then we suggest to have a release planning. And release planning is a very simple document. It's, it's one table really. And it's an aspirational plan of what to do and by when. Is we, our experience is that the, when the group is working, it's always good to have some kind of vision. It's okay, we want to achieve these documents or these features by this time. And that gives a focus to the group to work forward and, and dates. And having this in place is always helpful. And at the same time, when people arrive for the first time, they look, it's okay, I see they're working to these features and they want to release by. December. So obviously in that case, let's go to focus on these topics rather than bring all the topics uh, that maybe it will be for later on. Mm -hmm. So in the next slide, we are going to now dive into, well, before that, we have uh, the community specifications, terms and definitions. It can be a little bit different from open source. And this is one of the things that goes into the do uh, governance document. And here what we have is definition of working group, which is basically everyone is participating plus the repository, you know, all you put together, that is the working group. If you have only one repository, your working group is restricted to participants and that particular repository. If you have more, in that case, that is when could be even multiple working groups or even sub working groups, the flexibility is there. Participants, very clear, is anyone as well as contributing to the working group activities eh? under this community license specific, uh, sorry, the community uh, specification license. Remember, we set up the framework for that. Editor, as is listed on this, the person, so it could be more than one, they are responsible for ensuring that the content of the documents accurately reflects the decisions they have been made by the group and that the specifications uh, uh, adheres to the formatting and content of the guidelines. So we provide the guidelines, the editor should be familiar with that. And nevertheless, there is a, a fair amount of flexibility on things to, or there. And then the maintainer. If you look into an standards organization, the maintainer normally is called the chair. Here we call the maintainer. And is this person is responsible for organizing activities around developing and maintaining and updating the specifications. Uh, they developed by the group and is responsible for determining for determine the consensus and coordinating, uh, coordinating any appeals. Consensus is something that uh, we put a lot of emphasis in the standards, unanimous consensus, and we are going to see that in a moment. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone agree. What it means, unanimous consensus, is that everyone has voice, their views, 
and the group now understand and move forward. And they waste ways on how to do that. So I see that there is a question on there. How common is there to be multiple maintainers? It depends. I think it depends on the group. Uh, Jory, if you want to. Yeah, I would say that I typically see um, like two to three. And, you know, again, in the standards org, this might be a chair and a co-chair or a couple of co-chairs. In the open source world, you do typically see maintainer uh, groups that are one to three is sort of the most common uh, and you can do that here um, crucially and I realize it's not necessarily reflected um, well in in this the participants are the ones who select the maintainers and select the editors uh, so really the the decision making really sits with participants maintainers and editors are are persons called out with special additional duties maybe because it's something they have more time for, something they have a little bit more experience with or expertise in. Um, but uh, yeah, not not uncommon to see multiple people in these roles. Yeah. And, and our recommendation is normally have at least two maintainers. If one cannot be there, in that case, the other one replace. And uh, in the editors, it depends on the documents that you are editing. But uh, it's important as well that even if there are multiple editors, they come with some kind of a same approach on how to do things. Otherwise, you are going to be reading the specifications and you are going to see different sections written in a different format. And, and that is something that we should try to avoid. But yeah, it depends very much on the group on, um, on how many people volunteer. Because that is one of the things. Uh, like open source, this is a members uh, this is driven by the members and it's a volunteer uh, work. No one is obligated to do anything. But normally people stay forward, you know, they, they want to dedicate more time and have ideas on, on how to do some of this work. So if we go to the next slide, what we have now, we are going to dive in a little bit. I mentioned about some of the documents, they are admin documents. This is one of them. This is the contributor license agreement. And this is when you submit a contribution, this is the document that binds the working group participants to the legal and uh, governance terms established by the community specifications repository. And specifically, that document says that when you are submitting a contribution, you are doing it under the umbrella, and they listed the three documents on there, the community specifications license, the governance policy, and the code of conduct. So that is where we establish uh, that binding. It can be as simple as the document that we have on there. It could be implemented by uh, having a template in the uh, pull request, which each time that pull request is created, you will see listed this sentence on there. It could be a CLA bot. You know, there are these options that are open and available, uh, but the simple one is that you have a document is telling you that anything you submit into that repository is binded by these terms. So if we go to the next slide, uh, now we go into the community specifications license. Here is where we will be talking about the IP policy. You know, we are talking about uh, the copyright and the patents, and we will see in a moment. So the document itself, it covers the legal framework for participation and contribution to the development of technical material. This is where you establish that legal framework that uh, we mentioned about the community specifications. Uh, this license is not intended for source code development. It has been already pointed by Jory. You know, source codes tend to be more about uh, I grant a copyright a patents to my contribution, but here you have a, a concept that has to come together and that document can be implemented later in different languages and different formats. And the source code cover only one particular uh, you know, contribution for one particular language. Here is different. And then the other thing as well, in that document, um, uh, sorry, yeah, we, we jump into the community license. Uh, sorry, yeah, I was about to say that uh, uh, if there is a, um, uh, uh, like, uh, if the work is developing any code, in that case, here is where you need to insert as well what it will be your license uh, for software code. If you don't indicate anything, it's going to be done on the MIT, but the options are there for using other open source uh, uh, licenses. If we move to the next slide, now 
we are is inside of the community specifications license and we are going to focus what means from the point of view of the contributor when they go and contribute a, a, a document, a pull request with a contribution towards the rest of the community or to everyone. And it means here that the contributor is granting a royalty-free copyright license on each contribution to everyone. And at the same time is retaining the attribution of this contribution. So here is where we establish the legal framework specifically for the copyright. In the next slide is about the patent licenses. And this is always very tricky. When people get this, it really gets nervous about patent license. And the things we need to say here is, we are in a framework, legal framework. We need to establish things correctly. So this is not for you to submit something and then 45 days later re retrieve it back. This is to say, this, uh, this community specifications has a framework on how to handle this. And the things we say is, we discourage to anyone to submit something which under certain patent and later they say, oh no, I'm going to withdraw it because the system allows me to do it. Yeah, the system allows you to do it because we want to make sure that uh, if there is any error or anything, it is a way to do it, but it's not encouraged to do submit something too late to remove it. And I would like to bring the your attention. They have, a, a, I don't know even if I can read myself, right on the bottom of the diagram, it say the contributor, it grants to the licensees a royalty-free license to its necessary claims in the const in the contribution. And this could be in a pre-draft, in a draft, or in a specification that is going to be approved. And here what we try to indicate is that the, the contributor, it has up to 45 days to withdraw that particular uh, royalty-free license patent in case something happened. And it's legally, you can do it uh, in the pre-draft and draft, and before it's being approved, you cannot do it in a specification that has been approved by the group. And if you do that, bear in mind that the group is going to be really upset because probably what they're going to do is they say, okay, you are, you insert this content here. Now you ready, uh, re, uh, withdraw the patent. So let's go to carve it around. And that is not really good practice that you want to have in the group. So is a system on there in case for every company to be aware of uh, that it, it's a system on how to withdraw, in this case, any patent, but it's encouraged not to use it. And I see that uh, we have a question. Um, but if the specs are coming out of collaborative real-time working sessions that happen via Zoom or perhaps probably in a working document somewhere um, uh, where the editor is recording details from the conversation. Um, that's a great question, JR. Um, so community specification was really designed for the framework of we're doing the bulk of our work in GitHub. And we expect that the people who are participating in this project are coming to the GitHub repository and participating there. So we're capturing their input, be it in a pull request or, you know, some other sort of, uh, you know, tr tr the, the they solve the waffle board thing, issues, and so on and so forth. Um, if your group is doing more of its work outside of GitHub um, in more of a, what we would say like is a traditional kind of meeting driven development or of a specification or um, document driven development of a specification via like uh, Word docs and so on, then this may not be the right tool for you to capture, but it's gonna come down to, um, Kind of what your group is doing, um, how you like to work, and what is the easiest way for you to assure that your maintainers, editors, and participants are attesting to the license requirements as they do that work. And the other, the other thing to indicate is um, it could be a lot of conversations outside. Um, and we always recommend to uh, submit presentations and make it available to the group so everyone can see even after the meeting what was presented and they can go back 
And at the same time, at the end, you have to build specifications. You have to build something that people can agree and, and, and elaborate. And is that is the tracking that we recommend, obviously, to do through GitHub. And that is where we establish all these systems in place. A lot of discussion can happen outside, but at the end of the day, what is submitted is what it counts. So if we go to the next slide, what we have here is now the scope. And remember that uh, I mentioned that this is a really important document. People in the groups, they say, oh, the scope, they forget about it. No, actually no, because that is where, based on your scope, you are defining what is going to be, any patents is going to be granted in base of that scope. And that is the things you want. Uh, if the scope, uh, at the same time, if you make it very wide, in that case, those patents is, is going to be granted in a very wide scope, and a lot of companies, they don't like that. If you make it very, very narrow, in that case, you can start doing things that fall out of the scope. So it's important always to keep in mind the scope. And as I say on there, uh, because the patents are granted according with that. And the other thing is that the, the any changes to the scope are not retroactive. So very, keep that in mind. If you do the, any changes later, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything was applied at that time is under the same scope. Uh, That's something that you have to be careful. So a scope is an important document. That is the one I mentioned is an, an admin document, but pay attention because it can be uh, important in the long run. So the next slide, we have uh, procedures and best practices. So this is something that you are not going to find in the current community specification repository. This is something that uh, and you're going to see here that we would like to give you as a guidelines. The group can take it, evolve it, or they can just say, okay, I get it, but we are going to follow something different. It's based on best practice. So we know that it works and this provides a structure and, and, uh, and help the group to move forward. So let's go to the next first one. It will be about the document hierarchy. Remember, you are working to community specifications. We have light structure, but it's still there. And this, what it's telling you is that you have to be careful. There are different types of documents. There are documents, they are policy documents, normally established by the governance body. Is This is the ones we recommend do not touch. And you can see some of them on the right-hand side. Then there are the documents that are technical, uh, sorry, process documents. They are the group has the ability to evolve in the way they want. This is the one we call uh, the organization process document. It's not in the current uh, um, in the current uh, repository, but we are planning to bring it forward. And then you have the procedures documents. The is done at the level of the working group on some working group, and this is the day to day activities. And that is where you have the contributing guidelines telling you how to contribute to this particular repository. That document is under the control of that particular group. Release planning is an aspirational thing with what we want to achieve by when is under the group. And they, the group, they can define their own guidelines and best practice as they need. And in the next slides, we are going to show you some of these best practice. So the next one, it's going to be about, I think, is the, the specifications development phases. And everyone say, oh God, here we are, process, process, process. Actually, I this is something that people it does even when they don't realize they are doing it. At the beginning, you define the scope of what you want to do. You go into the development, we really advise that once you can, you say this work is complete, we say, please review it. Give yourself some time to read everything you have written, test everything you have done before you formally approve. At that point of approval is when the group is say, we have complete the work that we target ourselves to complete by this time. And then after that, they say, okay, now we have this group, this work is agreed by the group. Let's go to rubber stamp by the organization. So that is where we put the binding with the legal framework, where we say now the organization is going to formally publish this content agreed by the group. And then we put it outside for the for the community to take. And it's at that point where you can expect some feedback from the community in order to do the next release or some back uh, bugs fixes that you need to address. Now, I want to call out to yeah. Joaquin because I think this public feedback piece is is um, really valuable to to point out um, that 
again, because this work is happening in uh, GitHub, which is generally speaking a very open <laughs> environment, we really encourage that it allows you to get potentially more um, uh, you know, participants and contributors into um, maybe you learn about new use cases, new requirements that you didn't think of before. Um, but this public uh, nature of uh, the community spec is a big advantage. Yeah, that's correct. It, it is very important. If you're being, building something, you want to get the feedback of the community. You know, um, if it's any things that uh, is open for interpretation, you do not want that in the specifications because you want interoperability. Therefore, you want to make sure that everyone is understanding in the same way. Or they say, hey, now you develop this, why you don't go into this? You, you are missing this aspect that I think is important for us. It's a pain point. And that is the feedback you can use to create the next release. So if we go to the uh, next uh, slide, now we dive into the detail. And this is just a, an overview. You saw at the beginning the work item and then the publication. And this is just in between. This is the area where we say the development. And our recommendation here for the standards in general, you have right on the top, you can see the lines going the requirements, which is business requirements, not technical requirements at this point. The architecture, where you define the different components with the interfaces that are going to be into those components. They can be logical components. They can be physical components. It's up to you. And then there will be the technical specifications. And you can see the effort that we is indicate, you know, that uh, is a good practice is that uh, you dedicate an effort between 10 to 20% to develop your use cases, requirements, and, you know, you can add an architecture, which is another 5%. It doesn't take more than that. A lot of groups, they spend huge amount of time in building requirements and architecture. And in reality, where you are defining all of this in the technical specifications, this is the area where you need to dedicate most of the time. And even considering as well, if you're going to do something that you may need to test it. So testing is something that you have to incorporate as well on those specifications. So this is not a waterfall approach. It can be very dynamic as well. You can see that the faces, they can move forward and backwards. And it gives you an indication of where you should spend the time. And the bottom line, it gives you a world the milestones. Remember about the release planning, when I say an aspirational thing that we want to build, you know, it could be the final release by this date, but we want to build the requirements by this date, the technical specifications by this date. So that is where we tell you some of the milestones that they are typically in the standards organizations. And now if we move to the next slide, um, this is the approval, uh, review and approval process. This is really important. And let me see if I can summarize, is that uh, when I say before that uh, in standards, we, uh, a standards is, is looking for unanimous consensus. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone agree. It means that uh, we heard the voice of everyone. And this system that we put on there is very simple. It's a way to ensure that the voice of everyone is heard. And at the same time, give to those voices the option to say, I submit a comment versus I submit an objection. Mm -hmm. So the process is follow, uh, it will be something like this. Someone goes and submit a pull request in this case. It goes for discussion. The pull request, when you look at that, it's okay, this is an editorial thing. This is nothing uh, you know, controversial here. The editors, they can take that and immediately it can be merged. But if the pull request contain a new feature, and uh, something that no one has seen before, and it could be a little bit controversial, the group, and in that case, at a point, needs to say, well, let's go to put this document under review. And that's due to the policy of the group to decide five days, seven days, whatever they want. And people go and review the document and submit comments. So the comments is something you say, well, I think that they should be this and the other thing they should be in this way. But someone say, oh my God, we go in the wrong direction here. This is an objection. Guys, we should not do this. And he or they or she put an objection on that document. Now, an objection means that uh, because that is saying there, that document cannot be merged or that pull request as a result of consensus. Uh, for example, the group say, let's go to put five days on this document and we receive three OKs and it's no objections is received. 
is merged, gone. But an objection is being presented. Now that document or that particular contribution cannot be merged. And now what this go is the next uh, the next time the group needs to go and to discuss that. And here is where they say, okay, in my end, I put the objection. I say, no, 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 this is going in the wrong direction. I disagree with it. I present it to the group and I explain it. And now the group is say, okay, we hear you, Joaquin, but we don't agree with you. And it seems to be you the only one that is having that thought. And I can say at this point, well, actually I'm sustain my objection. And at that point, the group, the only way to resolve this is to go for a vote. And this resolution of the vote is the one is the unanimous consensus. Even if I disagree, even if I am the only person in disagree, in that case, that uh, is the, the will of the group. And um, otherwise, uh, it, it can be merged by the group. And I see that uh, we are already uh, uh, final in the time. So if we go to the next slide, I think we are, uh, this is where we mentioned about the CLA. We have the option to just mention it in a document. We have the option to insert it in a pull request template, or we have the options to bring in the bots, as you can see on there, there too, CLA and easy CLA bot. Hmm. Uh, uh, the next is, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, I wanted to just say that the LF's um, CLA, easy CLA bot uh, also is, is sort of more of a, for those who are looking for more of that control, um, does collect actually DocuSigned um, signatures against that. So we did have a question of on, on the CLA attestation, how we collect that. Uh, we can do that and, and actually get a digital signature. Uh, and then if you've got this uh, bot turned on your repository, we can also report out to you and your maintainer group who has signed that, which is a, sometimes a very useful um, piece of functionality for the, uh, uh, for the uh, maintainers and editors. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And the next slide is that this is highly recommended. Semantic versioning is that anything is approved by the group, allocate those X, Y, Z. X means uh, major chain, uh, minor chain. After min, uh, after major chain, it will be, for example, the first release is 1.0. The next release is an enhancement and it's backwards compatible. It will be 1.1. If you have a back fix, it will be, for example, 1.0.1. 1 1 it's important because that indicates to the industry how is developing your specifications. And I think that it was the last slide. The next one is just uh, about the wrap up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which actually I think goes well to Dan Applequist's question um, that, that I just said we'd answer live about that easy path. You know, we kind of went into some detail that, that maybe if you're new to this as maybe more detail than, than you necessarily need at this uh, point in time. But if you're ready to get started and you want to, you've got, you know, a simple specification that you, you want to uh, try out under this uh, method. Step one, go take a look at the community specification license and look at that with your, your project leaders. Make sure it makes sense to you. Make sure the, um, the, the definitions of, of working group participant, editor, maintainer of the specification um, advancement process that we outline all, all makes sense to you. Ask us, of course, if you have any questions, but then go copy those documents into your project repository and get to work. Um, there's, uh, again, some additional tooling and things that you can add in, like the, the CLA bot, uh, for example. Um, you need to go take a path at updating your scope.md, make sure everybody's on the same page about what your project is and is not going to do, um, and get to work, start meeting, start collaborating online, um, and, uh, and, and developing your, your spec uh, where you do your work. So that's, that's the hopefully quick, quick uh, story on uh, on that. Um, and of course, uh, if you want to get more feedback on other types of uh, tools, we have lots of resources here for you at the Linux Foundation as well. Um, yeah. Yes.
uh, I see some, there's getting lots of good questions so here in the last minute. Um, a uh, contributor certificate versus uh, per a, using a PR versus a, in place of a CLA bot. Okay, one thing we should have said, um, maybe to just ground this is, um, you know, we are not here to provide legal advice to you. We are uh, not not your lawyers, uh, and so on and so forth. So with that that being said, um, the answer here is about, in my mind, um, uh, friction for your project versus concern over risk mitigation and what kind of um, a testament you really need in order to accomplish the goal that you have. So uh, as Joaquin mentioned, we provide that CLA uh, uh, contributor agreement in the repository, and that may be sufficient for you. Um, you could go a step further and you can say, we're gonna have a pull request template, and we're gonna ask you to open a PR uh, that attests to that language via pull requests and add you to a participants.md file, which is something that a lot of open source projects like to keep as that sort of list of participants. Um, if you want a little bit more, then uh, you could add a GitHub's CLA bot, which is more like a click through type of agreement. Um, that's certainly sufficient in the sense that it gets you a list of people by GitHub account that have agreed to those terms. For some lawyers, that's not quite enough, and they like to see a signed document, and that's where the, the beefy, easy CLA uh, tool might be what you need because it actually collects a signature. It collects a signature from either a corporate contributor, from somebody who is authorized to bind the company uh, and can authorize people to contribute on behalf of the company, and then we can provide some reporting out to you. So uh, just, you know, it's a scale of comfort with what you need and what you want. Uh, let's see. Um, last question uh, or another question. Um, if I've got a spec that is already being developed under an open source software license like MIT, can I migrate to the community specification license? Um, and the answer to that is yes. Um, so uh, as Joaquin mentioned, the um, contributor um, or sorry, the community specification license uh, provides MIT for the source code license by default. Um, so this is a, the community spec license is a, uh, is, a, is a license that gives the contributors more rights. And so that's generally, you know, seen as a good thing. Um, if you're just kind of getting started and you are uh, developing, say, some example source code along with your specification, um, it's a it's it's a fairly easy task to go and to those contributors and get the uh, alignment that you might need, which is generally really easy to get because this is a pretty um, easy to adopt license, quite frankly, uh, get their agreement and then migrate into the CSL because it's it's as much as possible, we've tried to match the way developers like to do work on their software, uh, but do it in, you know, work on a, a specification instead. Um, so we've, we've done this a couple of times and not yet had any challenges. Um, oh my goodness, we've just, we've, we have had flowed through time. Any last questions? I guess I should put this uh, slide up really quick because uh, we're already at the top of the hour. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, well, um, I want to say thank you to um, everyone for attending today. We really appreciate you coming uh, to our first um, webinar from the standards team. We're planning to do more content like this, and I'd really love to hear from you if there's material, resources, support, info, anything that would help you as an open source developer get more involved with a standards project or start your own standards project, um, please reach out to us, admin at jointdevelopment.org, or you can check out the joint development website, um, and that will also link you to us. Um, and uh, we'd yeah, love, to, yeah. love to hear more from you. And any any challenges you see in implementing this, we will be more than you know willing to hear from that and, and see how we can uh, help and improve things that we have at the moment. All right, Candice, thanks. Uh, back to you. Thanks so much.
Thank you so much, Jory and Joaquin, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.